Secret of the Conde Romanos. Secret of the Conde Romanos. Clarissa Bell. Chapter 5. Helen had given birth to a fragile yet strong-willed little girl with a pale, opalescent complexion and lots of flaxen hair. Her eyes, for the time being at last, were two pools of milky blue. Must be a recessive gene somewhere in the family, Helen amused, because both she and Lysander were both brown-eyed brunettes. And she had felt sure throughout her pregnancy that she was having a boy, she had set her heart on the name of Blaze, and deciding at the last minute that the name would probably work just as nicely for a girl, was now asked regularly if she had named the child after a horse. So much women's intuition, she had laughed, concluded, and she now looked forward to a lifetime, she imagined, of explaining to Blaze he was a well-known third-century saint and scientist. Perhaps he was really only well-known, however, to Catholic schoolchildren who underwent the yearly ritual of kneeling at the altar, placing their necks in some sort of V-shaped contraption, and having their throats blessed by St. Blaise, or the sore throat saint, as they like to call him. Does she let you sleep, Alice had asked, having heard the horror stories of sleep deprivation as told by all new parents. She does, actually. She sleeps a great deal for an infant. When she's awake, watch out. She's charming and playful and entranced by anything that moves, particularly that bird mobile Lysander hung over her crib. And such lungs! When she's hungry, you'd think she was a cat in heat. What can I say? She's an absolute delight. Oh, Alice, we are so happy. And indeed, she looked flushed with joy. It came as no surprise to Helena that Alice's brief visit to meet the newborn came on a cusp of a pending departure. Alice would fly off to Europe again shortly, and she was wont to do periodically and was doing some last-minute fundraising. Helena had worked for years in the antique trade and had many contacts, both buyers and sellers, in the world of collectibles. I have a small favor to ask of you, Helena, Alice began. You remember my Uncle Jerry, don't you? You mean the one who plays the banged-up old guitar so sweetly? How could I forget him? Well, Alice explained, he has passed away recently and left that banged-up old guitar to me. The thing of it is, I think it might have some actual value, she hinted broadly. Alice, my sweet, that guitar has seen better days, as I recall. I mean, your uncle was a truly a virtuoso, but that poor relic, let's face it, it looked pathetic. She said not unkindly. I know, I know, Alice admitted, but I heard all the stories about Uncle Jerry, bought in Spain from a friend of a friend who was selling it for some guy called Diego del Gastor. Uncle Jerry loved that guitar more than he loved Aunt Sally, I think. I just have a hunch it might be worth something, and I simply don't have the time to research its value. Well, I'm gone. Could I leave it with you to find a good home? I'll split the money with you, whatever you can sell for it. But for my Uncle Jerry's sake, I'd like to find it a really good home. After a thoughtful pause, Helena winked and said good-naturedly, Don't see, don't see why not. I'm pretty good at foundings. And so it was that Alice departed for Europe a fortnight later, leaving her Uncle Jerry's guitar in the very capable hands of Helena. Gwendolina, have you named a kitten yet? Rogelio asked as he rolled up a series of Indian prayer dirties. They were woven of sturdy cotton fiber in wide blue and white stripes. Being just big enough to kneel on a pronom, they were one of the lightest and easiest to handle rugs in the store's inventory. I'm getting closer, Gwen replied, cutting short lengths of twine with which Rahelia would secure with each dury in a tight slip knot. You see, she continued, I want to avoid the obvious choices, such as Geronimo or Jerome, and go for something more original. I think I've got it. How do you like Blaze? Blaze, mi amor? Who is Blaze? Oh, Rahelia, of all the people, must know the story of St. Blaze and the fishbone. Gwen remonstrated her friend teasingly. Ah, the fishbone saint. Gwen could see the wheels of recognition starting to spin in Rogelio's mind. He saved the little boy from choking. Am I right, Muir? Exactly right, hombre. He was spared from choking on a fishbone, and as cats are so fond of fish, I thought he might be a good namesake. A kind of a guardian angel, if you know what I mean. I know what you mean, Guerra, Rogelio said reassuringly. That evening at home, Gwen took two unlit white tapers, crossed them in a V-shape on either side of the kitten's tiny neck, and said the traditional prayer that she had heard so often in her own childhood. 
May God, at the intercession of thy new namesake, she said, added with a wink, Saint Blaise, preserve you from throat trouble and every other evil. Amen. Blaise expressed his approval by batting at the candlesticks a few times and then turning to chase his tail. The next day being Saturday, Gwen loaded Blaze in his cat carrier for his first trip to the vet. Being male, she knew it would be necessary to neuter him soon, but today would just be a general checkup, shots, flea prevention, and so on. Or so she thought. Dr. Cordero's animal clinic was just blocks away and walk-ins were welcome low cost on Saturdays. So without an appointment or any clue as to the remarkable meeting about to occur, Gwen signed in and took her seat in the waiting room with Blaze in his carrier on her lap. First giveaway we should have been the music. Softly in the background, Gwen detected the strains of a flamenco guitar. It was an old recording and she recognized the inimitable Sabikas playing an alternatively submissive and dominant baruka. She had played it herself long ago and was immediately transported to a time far removed when she had held the guitar in her lap lovingly in Madrid, the Conde Hermanos. Now she sat a decade later with this sweetly mewing kitten in her lap, who was, however, getting louder by the minute. Someone is impatient for my services, came an unexpected male voice from the doorway leading to the examination rooms. Right this way, he motioned. Please come in. Hmm, no receptionist, Gwen thought. Dr. Cordero runs a tight ship. She could not help but notice the classical guitar leaning on the corner of the room she now entered nor the basket of loose sheet music with curled edges and coffee stains. Always a sure sign that the music is being studied and loved. So today you have brought me a little blaze, Dr. Cordero proclaimed warmingly. How appropriate that St. Blaze is the patron saint of veterinarians. I never heard that, said Gwen. Always thought he was the sore throat saint. Oh, he is, Dr. Cordero assured her, along with the fishbone saint. But many people weren't aware that St. Blaise had an uncanny rapport with birds and wild animals. He was once found by hunters, kneeling in prayer and surrounded by wolves, bears, and lions. As he was also a third-century physician, he took care of the animals and they, in turn, watched out for him. Many consider him to be the precursor of St. Francis. Dr. Cadero expounded freely on the subject while deftly administering to little Blaise. This is also fascinating, Gwen said with genuine interest and then added, I take it you play the guitar. Every chance I can, my dear, he responded. You see, medicine is my vocation, but music is my avocation. Like Albert Schweitzer, Gwen noted. Well, in my small way, although I do share his passion for Bach, I work on the Chaconne every day, in between patients. That is, one day I will conquer it, he said resolutely. It is my own Mount Everest, you might say. I used to play guitar, Gwen confided tentatively. Oh, no one used to play the guitar. It's impossible. You know the saying, once a guitarist, always a pain in the neck? Now, what exactly was <laughs> caused you to take this, shall we say, sabbatical? The good doctor inquired. So it was that Glenn fell under the enchanting spell of Dr. Cordero, and he became a second person after Helio to whom she told the story of the Conde Hermanos. I see, he said, taking a deep breath. So am I to believe that the spirit of the Conde Hermanos is sitting right here in my examining table, covering my forearms with playful scratches and chasing his tail? Yes, Gwen softly now, not entirely sure she should have trusted Dr. Cordero with this privileged information. But he quickly relieved her doubt. It sounds entirely plausible to me, however, I must invite your contempt by putting in my two cents on the matter. You need to get another Conde Hermanos, an actual instrument. And further, I believe, that the spirit of your old Conde Hermanos, as embodied in this sweet yet forceful little kitten, has directed you to me so I could tell you this. Once again, Gwen found herself wondering, is that really possible? Could I only bring herself to say? Even if I've agreed with you, Dr. Cadero, I could never afford one in my present situation. Back then I saved a lot of money by going to Spain to buy it. It's simply not feasible. Child, let me tell you something I've learned with age, Dr. Cadero said melodramatically, then whispered almost audibly, inaudibly, if there was a presence in the room he didn't want to hear. 
Everything is feasible. Leave it to me, he said in his normal voice. I'll do a little sleuthing in the marketplace. Then we shall see what we shall see. Helena continued to be so fascinated by her new young daughter and her curious ways, she did not have a great deal of inclination to pursue the sale of the Uncle Jerry's guitar. In fact, she dreaded it. She knew only too well the ruthless world of buying and selling antiques. One chip, one scratch, could render an otherwise invaluable item worthless, and many were the vultures lying in wait to descend upon such items as these. The condition of Uncle Jerry's guitar made it vulnerable, despite the confidence Alice so valiantly placed on it. Helena decided the best course of action would be to place a vague ad on Craigslist and word it like this. Vintage guitar for sale, engraved disrepair. Price negotiable. This would protect her from interested parties pointing out its obvious flaws and let her simply accept or reject any offers without having to actually haggle over the price. When she promptly received a most civilized call from a Dr. Carlos Cordero, she felt strangely at ease. My dear, he chided her cordially, you neglected to mention the guitar maker in your ad. Could I trouble you to provide this information before going on any further? Well, you see, that's part of the problem, Doctor, Ellen explained. The label is completely faded and illegible. I only know its general providence by word of mouth. Not a problem at all, Dr. Cordero said, without missing a beat. There are other ways of determining the maker of a guitar. May I come around and have a look at it? Perhaps this afternoon at two? That would be fine, Helen agreed. Hastily, as she was simultaneously nuzzling Blaze, nose to nose in the fashion the baby seemed to like best. Upon arriving, Dr. Godero began immediately to examine the guitar thoughtfully and thoroughly. Helena half expected him to take out a stethoscope and listen for breathing and heartbeat. Finally satisfied, he made his prognosis. I feel it is reasonably safe to say, he began, that this instrument is indeed a Conde Hermanos. It has all the all-important signature hardware design. The grave disrepair you so charmingly alluded to in your ad speaks well for its flamingo origins. Flamingo guitars, being subject to all manner of finger drumming and hand slapping, it all takes a grave toll over the years and it has the sound of one hopes to find in such an instrument. Then getting to the point directly, he asked, what is the least amount of money you would be willing to take for it? Well, Dr. Cordero, I'd rather hope that you would tell me the highest amount of money you would be willing to pay for it, Elena said simply. In that case, I have an interesting story to tell you. And so it was that Helena became the third person to hear the story of the Conde Hermanos, this time as told by Dr. Cordero. At the end of the tale, with all its many twists and turns, one detail stood out prominently to Helena. Did she really name her white cat Blaze? She asked incredulously. I examined the little foundling only days ago, Dr. Cordero replied. I had a white cat, very special white cat, named Crescent, after the moon. He died suddenly before my daughter was born. For some odd reason, against my better judgment, really, I felt compelled to name my daughter Blaze. It's puzzling, isn't it? Quite. Dr. Cordero agreed. Almost eerie, really. Well, I think it all points to one thing, Helena said, as if feeling her way unsteadily in the dark. Yes, Dr. Cordero waited patiently for her to draw her conclusion. On behalf of my dear friend Alice, who wanted to find, above all, a really good home for her uncle's guitar, well, she and I both would be honored if your friend would accept this guitar as our gift. I don't think we'd ever find anyone no more uniquely qualified to call this guitar their own. Nor do I, dear child, Dr. Cardero smiled warmly. Thank you on her behalf and mind for your kind and understanding heart. Several months later, Gwen called Carlos, for she and the doctor were now on a first-name basis. Carlos, Gwen exclaimed excitedly over the phone. I've discovered something highly unusual about the Conde Hermanos. I shouldn't be surprised, he laughed, and added, only what is it this time? Well... I was leaning against the wall with the afternoon sunlight hitting it just so when I noticed some small letters carved in its neck. They were extremely faint, but with the help of a magnifying glass, I could read them. And they said? They said, C.D.S. Geronimo. Would it be too much trouble to ask Helena if her friend has any idea what they stand for? No trouble at all, my dear. I'll phone her directly. By this time, Alice had returned from Europe and had been amazed to hear of the happy turn of events. I know this is, this is making Uncle Jerry very happy in heaven, she said as she cradled Blaze in her lap. 
Blaze, meanwhile, was making unsuccessful attempts to grasp the dangling earrings and that she wore. Oh, Alice, before I forget, Dr. Cordero called the other day. Seems they found the letters C.D.S. Geronimo carved faintly in the neck of the guitar and were wondering if you knew what they meant. No mystery there. <laughs> Alice giggled. Did I ever tell you my grandfather was from Argentina? She was a grand and formal lady who chose grand and formal names for her two sons. My dad, Mike, got off relatively easy. His first name, his full first name, is Miguel Arcangelo. My poor uncle, however, got stuck with Concepcion de San Geronimo. Is it any wonder he preferred to go by Jerry? When this final coup de grace was delivered to Gwen several days by Dr. Cordero, she staggered a bit before collapsing in a nearby chair. Carlos, this defies believability, was all she could bring herself to say. In what way, my dear, Dr. Cordero stood by with concern, poised to take her pulse if need be. Just that where the search for the Conde Hermanos all began over a decade ago on a street in Madrid called the Avenida de la Concepcion de San Geronimo. I can well understand your astonishment. I, too, am rendered speechless, was all the eloquent, eloquent doctor could manage to say. But it means something. What on earth could it mean, she said. I'm not sure what it means on earth. The answer probably lies closer to heaven. So at times like these, it behooves us to turn to poetry, to heavenly verse. In fact, T.S. Eliot is coming to mind right now. Oh, Gwen asked, still perplexed. Yes, you know the poem where he exhorts us to never stop exploring because ultimately we'll come to the place where we started, but only then will we know it for the first time. It's from the four quartets, I believe. Are you familiar with it? Only vaguely, and yet I think it sums up things rather well. Gwen posited as the small white kitten curled up in a ball on her lap and began to purr. <laughs>